Hi, and welcome back to Fundamentals of Bioinformatics. I'm Greg Caparaso. This is part two of the Machine Learning in Bioinformatics lecture series. In this lecture, we're going to spend some more time talking about unsupervised learning, and specifically, we're going to focus on doing a worked example of an ordination. As a reminder, last time we uh, compared unsupervised and supervised learning. Um, unsupervised learning, as a reminder, operates on the feature table alone. There's no sample labels uh, included in the computation of unsupervised learning results. Um, and these are generally used to observe patterns in the data, such as clustering of samples by similarity. Examples of widely used methods for this are principal coordinates analysis and non-metric multi-dimensional scaling. The math for both of those is fairly complex. And so for this worked example, we're gonna talk about a method called polar ordination. Now polar ordination, um, as with all unsupervised learning methods, works with the feature table only. And it starts by computing distances between all pairs of samples. The distances that are computed um, are up to the user, and typically this is something that would be done before you started the ordination. So really, more technically speaking, the input for polar ordination is a distance matrix, um, but that um, transformation from a feature table to a distance matrix is something that the, um, would always be included in part of the um, analysis. Um, so, for example, if we were doing a microbiome study, we might compute unweighted unifract distances between all pairs of the samples, and that would give us the distance matrix. So we would compute that from the feature table, and that would give us the distance matrix that we would use as input for polar ordination. Um, now, just a couple things I want to mention about this. Um, primarily, polar ordination is not widely used in practice. Um, it has some features that um, make it not work very well for very large data sets, um, but the math is very accessible. And so my goal with this lecture is to just give you an idea of one way that this type of an analysis could work. Um, and then you can uh, then take some of the ideas from polar ordination and use those to help you understand how more widely used approaches work. Um, again, more widely used approaches would be PCOA, NMDS, um, UMAP is another one. Um, and there's a great website, uh, Michael Palmer's Ordination Methods page, and I have a link up here um, to that. And so if you wanna learn more about ordination, that's where I recommend that you start. I refer to this website regularly. Okay, so um, distances between the samples. Um, we covered this in the microbiome analysis methods lectures, in particular in lecture two. Um, and we talked about unweighted unifrac as one of um, several distance metrics that is often used in microbiome studies. And so just as a brief reminder, um, this helps you go from a feature table and a phylogenetic tree that represents the features to one another to a distance matrix. And those distances would represent um, how dissimilar pairs of samples are. And so when you have a small example, like the one um, illustrated here, you can get a pretty good idea of the patterns in the data just by looking at the distance matrix. But more typically, you're gonna have a big distance matrix um, between uh, uh, comparing distances between tens or hundreds or maybe even thousands of samples. And so this is um, the first few lines of a relatively small distance matrix. And what I hope you take away from this is that it's pretty hard to look at this and take any meaningful patterns away um, just visually. And so typically what we're doing is doing something to get this into a format that's a little bit more accessible for a human to view. Um, and so in this um, plot that's over on the left, this is a principal coordinates plot representing um, unifract distances between the samples. 
Um, and looking at this, and especially in, um, in the context of sample metadata or sample labels describing which sample um, category or which category each sample belongs to, you can begin to identify some patterns. Um, and so, for example, one pattern that jumps out at me here is that all of those blue samples, um, which are from, uh, which are gut samples from human subjects in this case, are more similar to each other on average than they are to other samples in this plot. And so what that suggests is that the gut microbiome samples are generally more similar to each other than they are to the microbiomes at other body sites. Um, and so that's an example of an interpretation that I can make from an ordination plot that would have been very hard to make from this distance matrix. So the polar ordination method that we are going to work through right now um, is going to be uh, an analysis based on just six samples. And again, this is probably one of those cases where you could figure this out um, on your own. You could identify some patterns. Um, but by doing this just on six samples, I'm going to keep the ordination as something that we can compute um, in a, with a pen and paper. Um, now, there is sample metadata associated with these. Um, these, again, represent um, human microbiome samples. Um, but we're, you'll see we're not going to use these sample metadata or the sample labels um, in computing the ordination, but we will end up using them when we come and try and interpret the ordination. The key here that differentiates this um, from a supervised learning method is that in a supervised learning method, these labels or metadata would be part of the actual computation. That will be covered in the next lecture in this series. Um, now, as always um, with these lectures, there are worked examples in the corresponding book, An Introduction to Applied Bioinformatics. Um, and because there we're using a computer to help us compute this, the um, results are, uh, or the data set is a bit more complex. Um, and so what I recommend is work through this along with me um, on this small data set and then go look again at the um, corresponding chapter and uh, see how that might apply to a much bigger data set. Okay, let's jump in and start doing some of this. Okay, so here I have that same unweighted unifract distance matrix. And as I mentioned, this is the only file that we're going to be using or the only data that we're going to be using um, as input to polar ordination. So the first thing that you do in polar ordination is identify the largest distance in the distance matrix and make note of the sample IDs that are associated with that distance. And so the way that I would do that here is I would sort of scan down the columns here and remember that in a distance matrix, um, the diagonal is zero, which is indicating that the distance between any sample and itself is zero. And the distances are symmetric. And so, the, for example, the distance between sample B and sample A is the same as the distance between sample A and sample B. And so you see that here. Um, and so when we're scanning, we really only need to go um, either below or above the diagonal. And so what's the largest distance in this distance matrix and what samples are associated with that? Um, you, if you just did that scanning, you've noticed that um, 0 0.92 is the largest distance in the distance matrix, and that's between samples B and samples E. So now that we've done that, we are going to use that to define the first axis in our 
um, scatter plot. Remember the goal here is to create an ordination plot like that one that we were seeing. And so I am going to um, create, whoops, um, I'm going to create some axes down here. And what I'm going to do is I am going to, actually, you know, I'm going to start with just one axis here. Um, and what you do is you set the endpoints of that axis to be those samples that we just identified. Um, and so it doesn't matter which one you pick. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to put B on this end and I'm going to put E on this end, but that's arbitrary. You can do either. Um, and then the distance or the length of this axis is going to be 0 0.92. Um, so now I have to introduce a formula that we're going to use to place every other point on this axis. Um, and so I'm going to jot that formula down up here. And so I'm going to say AS equals D squared plus D one squared minus D two squared, all divided by two times D. So now, in this uh, case, AS is the location of some other sample on this current axis. D is the distance between the endpoints, um, and so that's not going to change. And so um, D is going to be the distance between B and E. Um, and that, of course, is going to equal 0 0.92. Um, and then D1 is going to be the distance between a current sample, something that we pick here, and the sample at 0 on this axis. Um, so that's going to be sample B. Actually, I'm just going to, again, change how I um, annotated this here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to label this as 0 and this as 0 0.92. Um, and so D1 is going to be the distance between some current sample and um, the sample at uh, uh, the sample at 0 on this axis and then, D2 is going to be the distance between the current sample and the sample at D on this axis, and so at 0 0.92. Um, we'll find all of those by looking them up in the distance matrix. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to start computing distances from each of the other samples. So each of the samples that is not yet on this line um, we're going to compute the placement of that sample on the line. And so we're going to work through every sample until we have all six samples on this line. And so first we will say um, the axis placement of sample A, so that we're going to call that AA, equals D squared, so that is 0 0.92 squared, plus D1, oops, sorry, Um, plus D1 squared. And so D1, um, like I mentioned, is the distance between the current sample, so sample A, and the sample at point zero on this axis. And so that's sample B. And so we find that distance by looking it up in the distance matrix. So the distance between A and B is 0 0.35. So we then have 0 0.35 squared, and then we subtract D2 squared. And so D2 is the distance between our current sample, sample A, and the um, 
sample at point 0.92 or at D on our um, axis. And so um, that is going to be A and E. And so that'll be 0 0.90. So 0 0.90 squared. And then we divide that by 2 times D, which is 0 0.92. Um, and so off screen, I'm just going to use a calculator to compute this. And so you go ahead and compute this on your own with your calculator. And the value that I come up with here is 0 0.09. Um, and so this is um, going to be way over on the left end of this axis. So AA um, is going to be way over on the left end of this axis. And so we're just going to estimate it and I will put it right about there. Um, what I also want us to do is I want us to just um, compute or, or keep track of these in a little table down here on the bottom. And so we're going to call this um, axis 1. And we're going to, um, whoops, we're going to keep track of the values for all of our samples here. And so we'll have sample A, B, C, D, E, and F. And so sample A is going to be at 0 0.09, B is at 0 on this axis, E is at 0 0.92 on this axis, and we're going to just keep working through to compute the placement of the rest of the points on this axis. And all of these notes will be linked, um, so you don't have to worry about jotting all of this down. Um, but next, we are interested in computing the placement of sample C on this axis. And so that is going to be A, C. And so, again, that's going to be D squared. So 0 0.92 squared plus now the distance between C and B. So it's going to be D1. So that's the distance between the current sample, which is sample C, and the point at, at uh, zero on this axis. And so that's B and C. And so the distance between B and C in our distance matrix is, oh, sorry, no, it is um, 0 0.86. And so I am going to enter that in here, 0 0.86 squared minus D2. And so D2 is going to be the distance between our current sample and D, uh, or sorry, the sample at uh, D on this axis. And so that's 0 0.92 um, E, sample E. Um, and so the distance between sample C and E is 0 0.88. Um, so I will 0 0.88 squared over 2 times D, so 2 times 0 0.92. Um, again, off screen, I am just going to use my calculator. And the value that I get this time is that AC equals 0 0.4. Four. So I'll enter that in my table here and I'll put C on this axis. Again, this is this axis is not really to scale here. Okay, so um, I am going to now move on. And we are going to compute the next value that we need on this axis, which is for sample D. And so AD, sample D, is going to be D squared, so 0 0.92 squared, plus the distance between sample D, 
and sample B. And so D to B is 0 0.85. And then uh, minus d2 squared, and so that's going to be between our current sample, sample d, and sample e, the other end of the axis. And so d to e is 0 0.88, and so 0 0.88 squared all over 2 times 0 0.92. So I'll move off screen and calculate this. And what I get here is AD equals 0 0.43. So 0 0.43, um, and then it looks like D is right nearby C. Um, again, not to scale. Um, those are probably a little too, um, well, maybe not. Um, okay, so I'm gonna make that D look a little bit nicer. So now we've got one more to go here. And what you probably noticed now is that some of these values are not changing when we compute this. And so rather than erase everything, um, what I can do is just erase the values that are changing. Um, and so D for this axis is always 0.92. And so we can just leave that filled in. The values that I need now um, we're computing for sample F, and so I'll fill in an F there and there. And so what I need is D1, which is the distance between F and B, um, and so that is here, 0.91. And so I'm gonna say 0 0.91. And then we need D2, which is gonna be um, between uh, F and E. And so F and E, so 0 0.50. Uh, if I go off screen and calculate this, what I get is 0 0.77. And so I'm going to put that um, in here, and we'll say that F is about there. And now what's interesting here is you can probably already start to see some patterns emerging here, right? So we see that B and A seem to be closer to each other, C and D seem to be closer to each other, and F and E seem to be closer to each other. Um, and so, you know, again, with a small set of samples like we're working with here, that might be enough information. You might be able to draw some conclusions from that. But we're going to keep going and we're going to compute one more axis here because it's possible that if you have many samples, um, one axis isn't going to be enough to get you the information that you want about this. And so what I'm going to do is, um, again, I'm going to copy this page and paste it. And I'm just going to clean things up a little bit here. Um, so we're no longer focused on that axis, um, that B to E axis. And so some of this information now is going to change. More of this information is going to change. So I'm just going to go ahead and erase these whole formulas. Um, and I think what I'll do is I will also just erase this plot down here. 
and we will start fresh with a new with a new plot. Um, and so here is our axis one. There's our axis two. I'm just gonna label some of the points here so we know that this is zero and this is 0 0.92. So same as last time. Um, and what we're gonna do now is we're gonna compute the placement of points on another axis. And so the way that you compute or the way that you identify the second axis in polar ordination is by finding the next largest distance on an axis that is uncorrelated with this first axis, um, or at least weakly correlated with this. So in practice, the way that you would do this would be to compute all of the other axes and then figure out which one has a large distance and a relatively small correlation with the first axis. That would be pretty time consuming. And so I did this um, ahead of time and decided that the next axis we're gonna work with um, is the C to F, is, is the one defined by C and F. Um, and so what that means is I'm going to put um, a sample C at 0, 0.0 on this axis. And I'm going to put um, sample F at 0, 0.87 on this axis. And so that's the distance between those. So I will do 0, 0.87. Okay, so again, you're probably wondering how I selected this distance here. Um, what I did ahead of time before coming into this exercise was I assessed the axes for their distances, so like the distances between all pairs of samples and correlations between the values that would have been computed um, for a given axis, for each given axis, and I tested those for correlation with axis one. Um, and so this is something that's very quick for a computer to do, um, relatively slow for a human to do, and so I just did this behind the scenes. Um, so just take my word for it that this next axis, axis two, should be defined by the distance between C and F. And in the corresponding text, I work through how you would tell a computer to identify that. Okay, so the, dist the distance defining this axis, D here, is 0 0.87. That's the distance between samples C and F. And so um, what I can do now that I know where these points are is I can place um, first of all, I can define the points um, at the ends of these uh, of this second axis, and I can place these points on that axis. And so F, for example, is going to be right about up here. Um, and C, for example, is going to be at about 0.44. on the first axis and zero on the second axis. And so I am gonna put that right about there. Um, so that's point C and that's point F. Um, we know axis one and axis two values for both of those right now. So now let's compute the ones that we don't know. So again, we'll do A, A, and that is gonna be d squared and so this time d changes and so now it's 0 0.87 squared plus the distance between a and c um, and so the distance between a and c is 0 0.83 so 0 0.83 squared minus the distance between a and F. And so A and F is 0 0.90. So 0 0.90 squared all over 2 times 0 
And so I'm going to compute this off screen. Um, and the value that I get um, for A, so I hope you're following along with me there, is 0 0.37. And so now I can plot point A. And so um, it's gonna be at 0 0.9, so way over on the left side of that axis, and then 0 0.37, um, and so partway up here, um, we'll say right about there and that's going to be A. Now we can do the same for the next sample. And um, because we already know D, we don't have to um, fill all these values in again. Um, we can just fill in some of them making a little bit of a mess with my eraser there. Um, but D is not going to change. And so when we compute the placement of sample B, we'll do that as A, B. Um, we're going to say uh, first the, the distance between B and C. Um, and so the distance between B and C is 0 0.86. Um, minus the distance between sample B and sample F. And so B to F is 0 0.91. Now you might sometimes see me come down a column, so 0 0.91. You might also sometimes see me go across a row. Doesn't matter, remember, because these are symmetric. And so either way, I'm going to find 0 0.91 as the distance between B and F. Um, if I plug all this into my calculator, what I find is that the distance, or sorry, the axis placement is 0 0.38. And so 0 0.38. And so we can put B on this axis, and it's going to be slightly higher than A, um, and over there at 0. And so there's A and B over there. And we'll now move on to the next one. All right. So again, I'm just going to erase the values that I need to replace or uh, yeah, replace in this formula. And this time we are going to be computing um, the placement of sample D. Um, and so we need the distance between D and C. Um, and I should just write up here um, between C and F. Um, and so um, again, that defines this axis here. And so we're going to go between D and C. Um, and so D and C here is 0 0.25. So we've got 0. 25 squared minus the distance between D and F and so D to F is 0 0.88 so 0 0.88 squared go ahead and plug that into your calculator confirm that I'm getting this right Um, what I find is, um, whoops, I should have erased this down here before, um, but what I find is that I get um, 0 0.02. Um, and so 0 0.02. Um, and so then we are at 0 0.43 and just barely off of that axis there. So, um, so D is going to be um, 
just about there, we'll say. Um, okay, one more to go. Um, so... I will make sure to erase everything this time. That shouldn't be in here. Okay, and we are now looking at sample E. So this is going to be A E, A E. Um, and so the distance between uh, D or sorry D one, the distance between E and C, we would look up in the matrix, and so we can go E to C. That's zero point eight eight. So we'll get zero point eight eight minus the distance between E and F, and so that's going to be 0 0.5, and so we'll get 0 0.50, um, and we will plug this last one in, um, so 0 0.8, 0 0.50, 0 0.50, and we are going to end up with 0 0.74. And so we will plug that in here. And now we are, for E, we're at 0.92 on the first axis. And then we're at about 0.74 on this next axis. And so I'm going to go ahead and put that up there. Okay, so now we have all of these samples um, on this axis, or on these two axes. And you can see that this is really starting to look like one of those ordination plots. Now, what we can do, um, and what I'm going to do here, is I am going to cut all of this out. Um, and I'm just going to move over to another page and I'm going to paste this on this page. And so now that we have all these points placed, what we can do is we can try and do um, some interpretation of this in the context of our metadata. Um, and so imagine that, um, let's look first at this individual column. And so imagine that we wanted to test those out as our sample labels. Um, what we could do is we could um, say we'll color um, the subject one samples in red, and we'll do the subject two samples in blue. Um, and so sample A would be red, um, sample B would be blue, sample C would be red, sample D would be blue, sample E would be red, and sample F would be blue. And so to me, what this tells me is that the samples that come from the same subject in this data set are not necessarily more similar to each other than the samples that come from different subjects. The reason for that is I don't see any clear color or uh, clear clustering pattern by color. Um, and so what I then might do is back up and make a different choice about my labels. And so maybe what I'll do is I will say, I'm gonna color the gut samples in black, the tongue samples in blue. Let me put a box around these so it's a little bit more clear. Um, the skin samples in red. And so now A and B would stay black C and D would become blue, and E and F would be red.
And so here we do see a clustering of samples by this sample label or this sample metadata, um, which in this case corresponds to body site. And so what this tells me is that samples that come from the same body site um, are more similar to each other than samples which come from different body sites. Um, so there you have it. That is a polar ordination of this unweighted unifrac distance matrix. And this is an unsupervised learning approach that, as you can see, helps us discover patterns in this metadata, or sorry, in this, uh, in this study data. Okay, so now there's a couple last things that I want to mention here. Um, and these are, are generally applicable to ordination results. Um, the first thing that I want to mention is that the axis, the order of these axes is important here. And so by definition, axis one typically explains more variation in the data than axis two. Um, and so um, we saw that here based on the distances represented on these axes. And so axis one is a longer axis than axis two here. That may not be um, appropriately captured with my scale, um, but that is a general rule when you're interpreting an ordination plot is that axis one is, more, is explaining more variation than axis two. And if you have additional axes, three, four, five, um, the amount of variation explained by each of those will decrease. Um, okay, next thing I wanna mention is that uncorrelated axes are important. Um, and so, um, or really like that the, the um, axes are intended to be uncorrelated. Um, so I did a little bit of hand waving in this video um, about how to get there, but you can find that in um, more detail in the, uh, in the reading associated with this video. Um, of course, if my axis values were perfectly correlated, um, there would be no difference between um, axis one and axis two. And so axis two wouldn't add anything that I didn't already know from axis one. There's a good illustration of that in the reading. Um, the last thing that I want to mention is the order of these axes is not important. And so I sort of arbitrarily chose, um, I believe um, it was B and E to be um, defining, yeah, so B was this point over here. Um, you can see it's at zero on this axis. Um, e is at 0.92 on this axis. Um, and if I swap those, um, what you would see is that um, th we would have the same interpretation of this plot. The plot would just be the mirror image. Um, and so we would still see these clustering patterns. And so in general, with ordination, the direction of the axis is not important. Um, and so you can um, generally feel free to just swap the direction of the points on this axis and you'll observe um, the same pattern. Okay, so that's where I'm gonna leave it for this polar ordination lecture. This is an example of unsupervised learning as applied to microbiome data. Just as a reminder, polar ordination is not something you'd use in practice. Think of it as a tool for learning about ordination in general. Um, and now that you've seen this video, you should go work through or at least review the more complex example that is presented in an introduction to applied bioinformatics. I hope this was helpful and I'll see you next time.